as an analyst, uh, the better you understand football, the better you're going to be. I, don't know, I thought it was amazing. So you mm. just literally at the game, you can get your phone out, um, point it at the pitch. It will recognize all the players on it, recognize everything. And then you just choose what you want to look at. Be really careful who's going to be the one mentoring you. Um, are they going to be someone who's around and can spend some time with you teaching you? Or is it going to be someone you never see? Basically, no performance analysts in New Zealand whatsoever in football. A month later, I was in Cyprus with the New Zealand women's team learning how to be an analyst at you know 3 a.m. Especially at that stage, I was you know 22 years old when I started. It was just brilliant. It was I get to go away and essentially just watch football all the time. As an analyst, you just have to be willing to learn and adapt because it's such a unique role in that. And to, apart from the football knowledge, you don't really have to be good at anything, but you have to be pretty good at a lot of things and yeah. a lot of time at the same time because if you drop one of them the rest kind of fall down hello and welcome back to my channel and as you can tell it's time for another industry chat video and today's guest is gary connell so gary is a senior analyst with the qatari national team he originally is from new zealand and has also worked with the national teams both men and women football in new zealand so he's done a lot of traveling as part of his different roles that he's had He's got some great advice for analysts and he's also got some coaching qualifications too. So I'm really interested to chat to Gary, see how the World Cup went. Obviously, he was over there for that. So I'm sure that was a great experience. So without further ado, let's get into the conversation with Gary Connell. Hello, Gary. Welcome to the channel. How are you doing today? Yeah, good. Thanks, Chris. How are you? Um, very well, thank you. And I really appreciate you jumping on and joining me. So um, before you join, Gary, I gave a little bit of an introduction, but I'd like to pass that on to the guests. So for those who don't know who you are, who are you and what's your current kind of job role at the moment? Cheers. Uh, yeah, my name is Gary Connell. I'm from New Zealand, but um, I currently work in Qatar at Aspire Academy. Um, I'm a senior performance analyst there. Um, even though I work for Aspire, uh, my main role is with the Qatar Stars League, which is the professional league here, and the national teams, just kind of coordinating performance analysis and data management between the two. Perfect. Very, very interesting. So um, obviously we'll go into your roles and you mentioned the coaching because you've got some coaching background and before we started recording, you mentioned obviously your A licence as well. So we're going to touch on that as we go through. So um, I'm just curious because a lot of people I spoke to or at least the people that I know more of are obviously from the UK and I know the UK scene and progression in terms of wanting to be an analyst, kind of the route that people were taking in England, so to speak. But just kind of curious to see what it's like over because obviously in New Zealand I'm talking about here. So how did you first get into to analysis? Because it looks like, which we will come on to, your first role was with the national team. So you've kind of gone straight into a into a thing. So I don't, so I don't know how that came about. But what's it like over there? Is it kind of a, a popular thing? And how did you come about it in the first in the first instance? Yeah, well, I mean, I suppose I'll start with myself. Um, honestly, I got into analysis just by being in the right place at the right time. So mm. I wanted to be a coach. Um, went to university, studied coaching, was doing my coaching badges got an internship at New Zealand football, just doing coach development. So basically I was just doing PowerPoints for a year, um, making them all look pretty. And then at that time, uh, the New Zealand women's coach, John Herdman left to go to Canada and took most of the staff with him. So there was essentially no one left uh, to staff the national team yeah. and basically no performance analysts in New Zealand whatsoever in football. So the new coach um, just knew me, loosely and said oh you're good at computers you want to try being an analyst i was like okay sure so basically a month later i was in cyprus with the new zealand women's team learning how to be an analyst at you know 3 a.m in the morning when yeah. i'm trying to code stuff and things like that so literally got into it just by being being in the right place at, at the right time and recommended by the right people i guess yeah so you in terms of like the football landscape in New Zealand then what's are they all are they all professional clubs over there how, how does that look and how many you mentioned there's no analysts so I'm, I'm presuming it's probably not the the highest of standard with there being quite a small population anyway so yeah I mean it's, it's definitely changed now so there's, yeah. there's more than one analyst now which is great yeah. um now especially what from when I was there there's papers university can study analysis there's whole postgraduate diplomas you can do analysis in so there's a, a lot more analysts coming out now and that's the route that people would take um in terms of the landscape in zealand there's one one professional club the wellington phoenix they play in the, the australian league um yeah. and then it's kind of semi-professional-ish slash amateur teams that play in the national league but you know no one in there is a is a full-time professional footballer they all have to have jobs doing yeah. other things at the same time yeah 
Okay, cool. So, and then in terms of your your coaching background, then Gary. So you've got you know you've you said on your I'm on your profile by the way your LinkedIn profile. So um, you've done some coaching. You've done some coach educator. You, your B license was kind of uh, New Zealand B license 2016. And are you currently on the A license? Are you doing that now, or how's how's that going? Um, probably one of the longest A licenses ever. I started in 2018, um, yeah. and then delayed it because I moved here. Uh, which was probably the worst thing because then COVID hit and then I couldn't go back for the next three years. Mm -hmm. So I finally finished everything I've had to. I've submitted an assessment and hopefully then I'll pass that on. And if not, then I'll just take the feedback on board and and try and pass it again. But I'm in the the end stages of the air license now, I guess. Yeah, perfect. So then have you, this is maybe going back then, have you done, what what kind of coaching were you doing before you were kind of, thrown in as an analyst then Gary what kind of was that just like youth coaching at what kind of level was was that at? um yeah so youth coaching basically at schools and um some of the better schools in Auckland which I was lucky enough to do um I was working with some of the New Zealand football development teams that played in the National League so being assistant coach for them um but never really you know any big teams or top senior teams things like that um, because I fell into analysis. And then when I first started doing it, I thought, oh, this would be a great way to get into coaching. But the more I got into it, the more I thought, I want to do this way more than I want to do uh, coaching. So I coach, you know, I'd say socially uh, for enjoyment rather yeah. than something I want to do as a career or anything like that. Yeah. Okay. And because again, one question which I kind of do ask quite a few guests because it seems to be a popular question that I get asked a lot is, the need for coaching qualifications as an analyst. So I don't know what your thoughts, obviously you've got them, so I'm sure you probably say that they've benefited you in, in what way, but what are your thoughts on that, Gary, in terms of an analyst actually having the qualifications and that understanding of the coaching side of things? I agree 100%. So I think there's probably two sides of it. There's understanding football better, which as an analyst, uh, the better you understand football, the better you're going to be. So the more you can go on these coaching courses, they don't just teach you how to coach. They go into detail about the different moments of the game. Um, the more the higher the qualification, obviously you're into more detail. Yeah. But then the other side of it is you, you learn how coaches are kind of thinking, I guess, how they're approaching the game, how they're approaching the training. So you can tailor your work to kind of match what they want more. So there's less interpretation from them about your work. It's just you're giving them the work and yeah. it's the way they, they want it done. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. And, you know, the, the role of, well, both the coach and analyst is changing. There does seem to be more of a like blurred lines between the two with coaches now being at least understanding what the analyst does as well. So uh, you, you want to kind of reciprocate that as the analyst and have that basic level of kind of understanding with from the coaching side as well. So um, just then going back to the, the, the break at New Zealand women's national team, then you said you basically mm-hmm. admitted that that kind of came about from a bit of a stroke of luck in terms of being in the right place, right time. So I'm sure that was kind of an experience for you. So, with, did that include like much travel in terms of were they going to tournaments and stuff? How how did that? Because I'm sure that was probably new to you at the time as well. Yeah, the, well, there was a lot of travel. So the first year I was with team was 2012. Um, I think we went on about five tours, including an Olympics at the end of it. So yeah. it was constant traveling, going away, um, come back, do my day job, which at that time was basically running the New Zealand football website and database. Yeah. Um, but just doing analysis after work or things like that um, and just literally learning as I went because mm. the previous analyst, he spent like maybe a week with me and tried to teach me all he could, but then he was gone to Canada. Yeah. Um, and essentially I was learning from the head coach who a long time before was the analyst of the team. But yeah. obviously he's the head coach. I can't be nagging him all the time trying to learn things. So it was yeah. <laughs> work it out on the fly. And as I said, usually quite early or late in the morning, depends how you look at it. Yeah, yeah. Because I, actually, I didn't. Even, I just kind of clicked further down. So you've got over thirty-five international tours and eighty-five international matches. This is with again the new the the women's team. So you've got the Switzerland Cup, Cyprus Cup, Olympic Games, um, World Cup, and then another Olympic. So yeah, you've been about a bit there, Gary. So that's I'm sure they were quite fun experiences. And were you kind of travelling as a, as an only analyst with that team? Was there anyone else doing analysis with you at that point, or just yourself? Uh, it was just me. I was just trying to think if we ever had um, someone else. When we played at home, which was very rare, I'd have someone else film for me at least so I could just um, watch the game and code the game. But yeah. most times it was just me. So I was first team analyst, training analyst, opposition analyst, things like that. Um, I would film and code the game at the same time, yeah. which 
I'm assuming is a skill I've lost now, but it was something I was quite proud of that I could do, but it was just from necessity that yeah. we didn't have much staff. So we had to be quite clever in, in what we did. Mm. Uh, but traveling, especially at that stage, I was you know 22 years old when I started, it was just brilliant. It was, I get to go away and essentially just watch football all the time. Mm. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. And the, the filming and coding at the same time is I've done that as well. I mean, it's a, I think analysts now have it a little bit, I don't know, but a little bit easier because it's like say, sure. the resource <laughs> stuff that they've got now is definitely more than we had back in the day. So, um, so that's really interesting. So you were you were with the women's team for according to this so over six years, and then you went across and worked with the men's team. So, um, was that you know, what were, when you were with the women's team? Were were you aware of the the analysts with the men's team at that point? Did that person move on, and how did that kind of transition move from the women's to the men's? Yeah, it was kind of an interesting thing because when I first started, the men's team, they didn't have an analyst. Um, right. And then they kind of saw what we were doing. So I would do little bits for them, but like never go away with them, never you know, go to games or anything like that, just kind of prepare the odd thing, but not yeah. very well. And um, when we got a new coach, I think it was 2014, uh, Anthony Hudson was the coach. He wanted his own analyst. Um, and then he brought in someone from one of the clubs in New Zealand who'd been working with the under twenties as well. And he became their full-time out. So uh, his name's Jace Kim. He works at Colorado Rapids now, I think in MLS. So mm-hmm. we just worked together for four years, essentially. So what are you doing? Oh, okay. That's cool. What are you doing? Oh, okay. That's cool. And almost became almost competitive in a good way. So he'd show me some of his videos. Like, oh, well, I really like that. I want to do that. And then I'd learn how to do that. He'd see something I do. Oh, I want to do that. So it was a really good few years, but then, when he left, um, there was obviously no one to do that role again. Um, so I kind of just did both, uh, not for long, just for a few months or about a year until I moved here. Yeah. But as far as I can tell, like before, international football is very different from club football. You've got loads of time to prepare. Yeah. Um, I can easily watch 10 games of the opposition and have loads of time to get everything together. I, there was no problem doing all the preparation for, for both teams. It was, wasn't was a big problem for me. Yeah, yeah. That was I was going to ask you about the, the differences. But again, the time is obviously a massive one. You're not playing games. as uh, Obviously, in the tournaments you are, but in the in the kind of interim period between, you've got that time to prep and stuff. So, so I mean, what would you be doing then in, let's say you've got no game? Because obviously the national teams do go months without playing potentially. So what what what's that time filled with in between? Is it just looking at more opposite is it just doing more of the same thing or is it doing different things um it's funny you say that it's i was always so busy um there was always we would watch as many of our players playing for their clubs as possible Um, a lot of the players didn't have their own analysts so i would get their video from them code their clips then send it back to them um some stats or with some feedback or anything like that Um, We had a development program that was going on within Auckland. So essentially I'd let the interns that were New Zealand all the time run that, but I'd be helping them quite a lot with that kind of thing. But there was always, yeah, there was always definitely something to do Um, with the under 20 and the under 17s in New Zealand. They uh, qualify for World Cups through Oceania. So basically every time they qualify for World Cups. So helping them prepare for their tournaments. So there was always, always something to do. It's yeah. definitely not boring times. Yeah, yeah. No, that's like what you mentioned there because obviously the teams in New Zealand didn't all have analysts and you were coding the games for the players there. Like mm-hmm. if you were in England, for example, you probably wouldn't have to do that because it, they would already be coded. You could just get, yeah. you know, get that from the club. So, yeah, I suppose that would obviously fill a lot of your time. So, um, so then with the, the men's, obviously, I'm presuming you did some traveling. Uh, that was 2014, 2018. So they didn't. They weren't in a World Cup or anything then, were they, I don't think? No. So, um, yeah, I mean, like I said, the, when I first started, the, they had a home game. I was just helping them with a few bits. They had an interim coach. And then when they got their, their full-time coach, I kind of just was just supporting the analyst while he was learning. But then at a point, we were just equal. So yeah. they just kind of did their own thing. And they had two analysts for the last couple of years of their cycle. So they were um, in a much better setup than me because um, – they had Confederations Cup, they had World Cup qualifiers, and they were just pushing everything towards that. But um, I think when the when that coach left and their analysts left, then I started traveling with the men's team. And it was, a, I guess, a, a very different experience because 
the men are coming from, you know, incredibly physical leagues. They're traveling a long way. And the, the way that we do analysis has to be so different because you're almost just making sure the players are happy being there. You don't want to bombard them with video or anything like that. And the way the, I guess the biggest difference is that women's team, whether they start with the senior team or the under 17, they've had analysis their whole time, the whole careers, and they've just so used to it. Yeah. So but with the some of the older men's guys, you can't do a lot. You have to tailor yeah. it to them. And I guess yeah. that was the biggest difference between them. Yeah. And then I, 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 mean, I don't know what they were when you were, were there, Gary, but I'm just kind of looking at the world rankings just to kind of get a perspective for the view. So New Zealand currently 105th in the FIFA rankings, obviously, then we'll speak about because you can move to, to Qatar. So Qatar are currently 60th, I believe. So that's kind mm -hmm. of the ballpark of, of where they are. So... In terms of then, you mentioned kind of interns and other analysts and stuff. So were you ever, um, were you in that process of hiring those guys or bringing those in? Was that something that you do? Just the reason I ask is what, what if so, what kind of things were you looking for and what makes a good analyst really in terms of someone that's starting out? Mm -hmm. um, in New Zealand, there wasn't much hiring going on. So the coach hired his analyst um, based on the recommendation of assistant coach he worked for. Everyone else was working for free. So our under-20, our under-17 analysts, they were university students. They had to do a placement as part of their hours. Yeah. So the way I saw it is they can be the intern for a year and they go away to a World Cup as part of it. Yeah. So when the under-20 World Cup happens and it's in you know, Japan or Korea or wherever or France, they go off and be a part of that. So that's the kind of reward for doing that. But there wasn't much hiring going on it was yeah. students and all I was looking for was just willingness to learn and just be keen because one of the best analysts I had he wasn't a he wasn't a football guy so he came from a hockey background yeah but he really wanted to learn he got more and more into football he was watching more football at home as part of the role so I think as an analyst you just have to be willing to learn and adapt because it's such a unique role in that and to, apart from the football knowledge you don't really have to be good at anything but you have to be pretty good at a lot of things and yeah. a lot of time at the same time, because if you drop one of them, the rest kind of fall down. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's a good way of putting it. I, I mean, just the comparison, I know it's probably changed maybe now over the years and stuff, but the difference you described in there in terms of the New Zealand landscape with analysts and then from what we see now in England, in terms of the numbers that, like universities are churning out at the moment, there's just so many people wanting to do it, you know, there's, and obviously there's only a, limited number of jobs even if the clubs add another one or two to the department it's still never going to be anywhere near the number of people that are coming out and trying to do it so that's why it's just so competitive um over here especially so um so so new zealand then kind of when did you leave there so you were there for yeah well yeah another six yeah six yeah, six years weren't you there and then moved over to um, aspire academy in um, qatar so how did that come about gary was that just you seen a job and you and you applied for it, or was it a recommendation? Like, how did that kind of come to to your to your kind of thought process? Um, it was a little bit of luck, and again, um, there was a a guy that worked for High Performance Sport New Zealand who was a, an Excel expert, mm. and he would help me learn Excel, build my databases, build my reports, things like that. Um, he somehow was the one who built all of the Excel databases for Aspire Academy. Um, and when they were looking for someone to do this role, they reached out to him and they said, oh, Gary might be good for this. And then all of a sudden I had an interview and then, yeah, and then I got on a plane and moved over here. So there was never, it wasn't really a thought of leaving, but um, it was quite a lot of transition going on at New Zealand Football at the time with new technical director, new men's and women's coaches. So it was a reasonably good time for me to kind of move on and try something new. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, you mentioned, obviously, a bit, like you said there, look, and, but I think there's more to it than just look. I mean, obviously, you knew that in terms of kind of your network of people that you know and things may come of that. But, um, yeah, it was interesting that it did come come about how you described there. So what was what was that like initially then, Gary? Because I'm sure um, living in Qatar is different to living in, in New Zealand. So what were the, you know, like the initial kind of changes and things that you noticed that were different and how did you kind of settle into the new the new country, really? Um, I think the biggest problem before I came is I read a lot of stuff on the internet about what it was going to be like. And then a lot of that wasn't true. Mm -hmm. So you get here and you think, oh, it's going to be super modest and you can't wear t-shirts and you can't wear 
wear shorts and all this kind of stuff and you get here and it's a lot more relaxed than everyone thinks. So, I mean, it did take some getting used to, but the lifestyle here is I can do a lot of the things I do in New, I did in New Zealand. Um, yeah. You know, really happy here. It's a very, um, very easy place to live um, in terms of if you want, you know, if you want food from the UK, it's very easy to get. Not so much from New Zealand, but I mean, New Zealand basically has all the UK foods anyway. Yeah. So there wasn't a lot of culture shock going on here. The worst thing is the heat. So yeah. most of the year, it's actually quite nice. And then June, July, August, it's it's horrible. It's like living in an oven. So yeah. 50 degrees with humidity, you go outside, you just want to go back inside again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just for people that are watching, what's the, what is the kind of weather like now, like this time of year when you're over there? Uh, it's beautiful today. So it's... 24 degrees at the moment um bright yeah. sunshine so this is the this is the nice period and um, mm. before it turns into that summer that i was talking about before but for most of the year it's just a really pleasant place because you know it's going to be sunny yeah. you know it's going to be hot or very hot basically yeah. so pretty easy to predict what's going on yeah it's, that's funny you say that because it's not gone out yet but I, I recorded another one of these um last week with someone in america and they had two feet of snow so that's just the, the <laughs> person. <laughs> Literally, last week I spoke to him. So um, the difference, difference. Is, is quite different. So um, perfect. So you've kind of gone over there. You've gone. So what? What have you actually gone over there, as Gary, in terms of your job role? What What are you doing over there, basically? Yeah. So when I started, my role was manage the analysts in the Qatar Stars League. So at the time, the league employed twelve analysts and allocated one to each club. So yep. my role was to manage them and the main thing was make sure that all of the data that they collected, which was training data, um, match data, GPS as well, because for some reason these analysts are expected to collect GPS. Yep. Um, and all of that gets filtered into a system that um, Aspire built and that I manage yep. for the main reason the national team can access the player's data whenever they wanted to. So yep. they can see their player's performance in the club basically in real time yeah interesting so then those analysts are they do you say those are employed by the aspire academy rather than the clubs are they put the analysts into the clubs aspire uh, they were so when i came over they're employed so this is where it gets a bit tricky so they're employed by the the league yeah but in qatar we have aspire we have the qatar football association and the qatar stars league as three different organizations mm. but we all work incredibly closely together you could easily take uh, an Aspire shirt off and put a QFA shirt on one day or a QFA shirt off and put on the QSL one the next day. But yeah. everyone just works together for the betterment of football. So then, but then the stuff that you're asking for, I'm presuming that's uniform across every team. So you are receiving the same information from every team. Is that fair to say? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So we supply them with um, the online tools to enter all their data. We supply them with the hardware that they need yeah. um, to collect everything and it's an expectation from the league for the teams that if you're a part of this league, you will be providing all this data to the QFA. So it's not to Aspire, it's through Aspire, but it's yeah. going to, to the QFA, yeah. yeah. Yeah, sure. And then so those 12 teams you said in the Qatar Stars League, mm -hmm. and then is what's the rest of the football landscape like in Qatar? Then is there a league under that? How many, how big is it? Because obviously it's not a huge place, is it, in terms of size and population, really? So is the are they all professional in the top? And then is the is there a league underneath that as well? Or yeah. So yeah. Um, I mean, top league is professional. There is some players that uh, that work or are in the army or things like that, but I think it's mm -hmm. just by choice. Um yeah. there's the second vision below that, which I wouldn't say is fully professional, but there's a lot of professional players within that. That's got eight teams. And then once you get below that, it's more just amateur football. Um I mean, I'm not sure how accurate it is anymore, but when I started, there was only four thousand Qatari footballs. So there's not a lot of footballers to make up these leagues. There's only 300,000 Qataris that live in Qatar. So yeah, yeah. there's never going to be a, a massive yeah. amount of footballers available. Um, there's a huge amateur football scene with um, the expats that live here, which is mostly ethnicity-based, which is great. But that doesn't exactly aid to Qatar football. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah. sure. So then, because uh, just before we join, and again, looking at the ranking, so when the World Cup was announced in 2010, Qatar were kind of ranked 100, 114th, and I think now, like I said, they are 60th. So there's been a, obviously a progression over that time with the help of um, Aspire and all the data that you're doing and all that sort of stuff, and amongst other things. So um, 
So are you based then at the Aspire Academy then, Gary? Is that where you would kind of go to work and that's where you work from? Yep. Um, so I'd be on the first floor, which is Aspire, and the ground floor is the national teams. So we're not very far apart. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> uh, the, the, it's all kind of closely knit and intermingled then with the three organisations you mentioned. Okay, so, and then in terms of your role then, what's your what key relationships have you got in terms of other personnel either at Aspire or at the national team? Who are you kind of having day-to-day conversations with and meetings with that's important for your role? Yeah, so it'll be um, with the national team, the physiologists uh, or sports scientists, kind of interchanging between two terms, and the analysts. So if they need something or they are wondering about something or they need something tracked or things like that, then they'll ask me. Or um, a lot of time it's a higher level than me. So the coach might ask my boss and then the boss will come to me and then we figure out things that way. Um, We've just had a change in national team staff. So not 100% sure how that's all going to work going forward. But for me, it's just exciting to kind of work with some different people. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then in terms of then the academy, again, I I know you're not solely with the academy. Just curious to see... Is it is it similar to an academy, basically in the UK, where you you got all the age groups up? Is that kind of what the Aspire Academy has, and it's just kind of help, helping to develop players for the national team? Is that kind of what what you'd say the role was? Yeah, I think so. So they got start at under thirteen um, in terms of the the full time guys to under eighteen. Yeah, um, they train every day with Aspire, but they'll play for their clubs. Hmm. Um, once you get to under sixteen, under nineteen. One of the best things I think about being here is that they'll just change their shirt when a national team game comes up. So, oh, it's a national team game, under-16 Aspire becomes under-16 national team. And I think oh, that's yes. such a massive advantage over other countries around the world is that when they get their age group teams together, you know, they're learning each other's names and learning everything, whereas these guys are just training together day in, day out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very, very interesting. So so then in terms of the, let's talk about the World Cup then, I suppose. So um, you so you moved in 2018, so that's obviously four years before the, mm-hmm. in muddled up with years, yeah, four years before the World Cup started. So I'm sure like kind of preparations and planning was kind of in place even then at that point. So what, I suppose the question, first question is, what, what was the what was the World Cup like for you, Gary, in terms of what your role was like for that particular month or maybe just before and how, how you enjoyed it, really, if you enjoyed it? <laughs> no, I did definitely enjoy it. Um, so my role with the team was basically just support them with anything they needed. Um, but they were a very tight staff, a very good, experienced staff, and they didn't need me to do anything. So <laughs> for the World Cup, I was... Just a fan, basically, just going, yeah. enjoying the games, um, supporting Qatar, obviously, but really just going along and, and watching some good football. Yeah. And then in terms of then the preparation, because obviously I've seen some things on, on LinkedIn and stuff with every club that's coming is going to have their analysts or team of analysts. Did was did you have any relationship with FIFA at that point in terms of did they come and set the guidelines of what's going to happen at the World Cup? Or I mean, I don't know how that works at all. I've just seen some things on LinkedIn, really. Did they come in and give you ideas and kind of best practices for analysis kind of things for when the clubs are coming? Um, So I was quite lucky. We had a a massive conference run by Aspire, but also FIFA as well, is where we invited all of the analysts from every team at the World Cup to a conference in Qatar to say, hey, look, this is what we're going to, FIFA are going to be providing at the World Cup. You'll be getting this kind of video. You'll be getting this kind of data, this kind of report. And it was do what you want with it rather than you should be doing this, 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 and this. They just said, here's what you want, do what you need. So it was more, uh, here's a resource, you know, it's up to you rather than you should be doing A, B, C, D, E. Yeah. Yeah. So then, so you said there you weren't really, you were more of a, a fan of the actual games and you were, you were, didn't really have much to do at that point. So were you going to other games as well? Were you, were you getting around many other games other than, other than the Qatar ones? Well, <laughs> it's quite lucky because of the way the World Cup was is that um, you could go to a, a lot of games. So yeah. I wasn't one of the crazy pe- people that went to two games in a day, but I went to a game every day of the group stage. Yeah, because nice. it was just you know the furthest stadium was about forty five minutes from from my house, so really? the closest one was about fifteen twenty minutes away. So it was very easy just to to go to a game, enjoy the game, come home, and then repeat again the next day. Mm. So it was a really cool experience for a fan to be able to you know watch a world cup like that and see so many games as well yeah it's incredible that 
the World Cup literally all because it just took place, like I say, with within an hour's drive of your house, you've got basically every single game for that World Cup final. That potentially, if you wanted to, you could have probably gone to them all. Because I, I did see people online online go into a game in the morning and then go into a game later on and stuff, which was quite crazy. You don't normally it's like a flight between each one if it's in a big country <laughs> or anything like that. So we kind of touched upon FIFA. And I th- I've seen a post that you put on LinkedIn, Gary, um, where you kind of showing the, was it like the augmented reality that FIFA done? So you yeah. can hold your phone over the pitch and it was showing you the the stats, maybe the kind of visualizations on there. So I obviously didn't see that. So, I mean, are you able to just describe what that kind of was and, and what that showed you and how cool that kind of was for, for you to see? Yeah, I, I thought it was amazing. So you mm. just literally at the game, you can get your phone out, um, point it at the pitch, it will recognize all the players on it recognize everything and then you just choose what you want to look at so it's not super detailed like an analyst would want but mm-hmm. from a fan's perspective it was really cool yeah. um and even there was a few useful things like i was just seeing oh which side of the pitch is this team attacking down more and you could see that they're attacking way more down one side oh that's interesting information or you click on a player and you can see how far he's run and his top speed and things like that or see the formation that they're playing in and out of position. And if you're not sure who a player is, you just click on him, it'll say his name and his club. So just little oh, things like that. But it was just cool. so amazing that it was all just so easy. Yeah, no, that's really cool. And you could do that from basically wherever you were in the stadium. You could just pick your phone out. and It didn't work so well if you're closer to the pitch. So you kind of need yeah. to have the, the cheap seats basically and be further back, yeah, So yeah. which was me most of the time. <laughs> no, but that's that's really cool. Like just hold over, you can see all the like I say, maybe not the really in-depth stuff, but as a as a fan to see that, you know, it's interesting. And like I say, if you don't know a player, you just click on them and it'll tell you exactly who they are. So that's that is really cool. So okay, so let's let's kind of move move forward with that. So um in terms of then let's talk about data actually, um, Gary. So you mentioned one of your roles is to kind of to manage the the data and, and stuff from the the uh, Qatar Stars League. So What's your kind of experiences? Would you class yourself as a data? What's your skill level like in terms of data? And also, what kind of role do you see data playing? Obviously, it's kind of playing a big role in in the Qatari national team, from what I can tell. So, um, just in terms of data, because again, a lot of analysts now are looking to kind of add those kind of skill sets to themselves, so they do become more employable. So, just what's your thoughts on that, really, Gary? Um, I would 100% call myself a performance analyst and not a, a data analyst. So mm-hmm. the data analyst that I know, some of the stuff they can do is just unbelievable with with R and with Python and with coding and things they can do. It's just incredible. But from when I started, I was always a, a big believer in data. Mm-hmm. Um, I think being able to, having to do everything yourself was almost a blessing because the statistics that I was creating were things that I knew would be used and I knew would be looked at and I knew what the coach wanted. Um, I think one of the biggest problems now is you can get thousands and thousands of metrics from one game and you don't really know what to look at. And I've seen people put reports together that are just just numbers all over the place and without yeah. reference, without benchmarks, it's just it's not useful. And mm-hmm. the best use of data is you speak to the coach and you say, look, what, what do you want to get out of every moment of the game? Um, mm-hmm. You're attacking, what do you want to see? And you can go and find those numbers, figure out what the benchmarks are for them, and then just give the coach some really simple reports after the game saying, uh, when we were trying to turn them from the right side, we were only 20% successful. And usually we're 40% successful. Yeah. And obviously I just made that up, but speaking to a coach, they'll take that and go, oh, that makes sense. Rather than just saying, oh, on the right side, we turned them five times. What yeah. does that mean? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, I think the way you deliver it is 100%. You can be the probably the best analyst in the world, but if you can't get your message across, to the coach and they can understand it, then it's kind of pointless being being there in the first place. So, um, so definitely. And then in terms of um, what, what's what's next for you? Then obviously the World Cup's done now, Gary. So what what's what's your plans to de- further develop the you know the role that you're in now? Kind of what's what's what you kind of looking forward to in the coming years? Yeah. So I mean, Qatar's hosting the Asian Cup um, start of next year, so January 2024. Even that will still be called the 2023 Asian Cup. Mm-hmm. So it'll be building towards that um i think now it's kind of just getting back into normal football because the world cup was great but it it really interrupted everything that was going on in qatar so there was massive breaks from the league and everything like that so i think everyone's just enjoying having a normal league normal cup competitions rather than this you know breaks from the national team and things like that so it's kind of just for this season it's 
supporting. We've got a few technological things that we're trying to implement and make things easier, but nothing yeah. groundbreaking. And then for next season, it will kind of be ask the analysts, what do you guys want to be better at this season? So mm. I'm kind of giving them a lot more ownership. We try and get them to present a lot to each other rather than me uh, all the time. Yeah. And then because we've got this collaborative approach that no one has in the world and we really try and make the most of it. Yeah. And then, so you mentioned, Asia, so Qatar won the Asia Cup in 20, 2019, didn't they? So that was, and that's Korea, like South Korea, uh, all them them kind of teams that, that you're playing. Who did you play in the final? Who did, who was that against? Japan. Beat Japan in the final. Okay. Because yeah. Japan did decently well in the World Cup as well, didn't they? So it's, yeah, that's interesting. Okay. So, and then a couple of questions then in terms of, well, first one, we touched upon a little bit with the travelling, but what would you say so far, Gary, is maybe your highlight of the career so far? What have you enjoyed the most out of the roles that you've you've done in the past sort of five, ten years? Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. I think when I was a, a real analyst, I'll call it, I think going to the Olympic Games was just such a cool experience because, mm. you know, it's more than just football. It's something that everyone looks to and everyone's watching. Um, in 2012, in particular, in London, it was such a really well-organized event. It was very easy. Um, we made the quarterfinals as well, which was great and way above what people probably expected. Yeah. Um, that whole tournament was just brilliant fun. And it was almost like, this is my first year of being an analyst. So mm. you know, it was such a rewarding thing to be able to do. I think more so recently, seeing people that I've helped grow as analysts or mentored a little bit to get good roles around the world, people working in MLS or Premier League or national teams mm. and see them enjoying themselves and succeeding is something I'm, I'm really proud of as well. Yeah, cool. Good answer. Good answer. So then, again, something you've kind of touched a little bit on in the advice, but just one thing I do always ask at the end is, just any further advice you would have, as I said earlier, uh, Gary, a lot of the listeners are people potentially still at university and they're looking to be an analyst like yourself. Um, so what would you say to them is maybe one or two things that are important for them to progress in their in their career? Yeah, I think one of the, the most important things for people getting into analysis is, is finding a good either internship or first role or things like that. I think be really careful who's going to be the one mentoring you. Um, are they going to be someone who's around and can spend some time with you teaching you? Or is it going to be someone you never see and you're just on your own filming training and being a general dog's buddy? So yeah. if you can, you know, use your lecturers or contacts or anyone you know to just find someone who you know is going to be able to spend time with you, um, that's going to be so, so beneficial compared to if you've just got a job at a club, even if it's a big club and you think, oh, it's so good to be able to work here, you might just be on your own filming and hanging. Mm -hmm yourself and you won't learn anything yeah you're just better at those two things yeah that that's a great point i've spoke about that before in terms of yeah you you know some clubs will just even if you say they are you're happy to be at a big club but you're not actually learning you just you are just doing the same things day in day out and then basically you are just then just working for free for no real reason you're not you're not learning so i, I always say like if you're going to do an internship make sure you are getting the most out of it you can and be proactive in learning you know in finding out and speaking to your mentor and kind of asking them to spend more time and, and do different tasks throughout that so you do come out a better analyst afterwards so um okay so just before we wrap up gary i do ask and may not be a reader or anything but i do ask if you have any recommendation of any books or any podcasts not necessarily sport related that you want to give a shout out to yeah, so when, when I saw this question, I was just thinking, I, I just don't read and I don't listen to podcasts. So, okay. I think, yeah, I'm quite lucky. A lot of my learning at Aspire is almost given to you because we yeah. have such a massive network of, of clubs and we get so many presentations and people coming through that there's always chances to learn that way. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe I should get into books or podcasts, but in terms of recommendations, I'm, I'm not helpful at all. No, no pressure. That's fine. No problem at all. So perfect. So is there anything else, Gary, you want to add before we, before, before we wrap it up? I mean, I've gone through pretty much all my questions here. So anything that you want to say before we leave? Um, I think just to add on to that advice thing, just for, for analysts that do get a job, because it's, it's such a young person's game that you could have a great job when you're 23, 24 and, and think you've made it and just kind of cruise, just don't stop learning. So I totally did that. Once I was in with the Nash team, I just thought, oh, it's great, I'm good now, I can stop. But um, once I went and looked at what other pl uh, clubs around the world were doing, I was like, I'm so far behind. Mm -hmm. So just keep yourself learning. If you want to do coaching badges, do coaching badges. If you want to do more qualifications, do more qualifications. Or just 
reach out to other analysts and just have mm-hmm. analyst discussions, but just don't carry on doing your own thing and thinking that you're good just because you you've got a role. Yeah, just kind of coasting along. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a definitely a good point. So no, that's a good place to to, to end it, Gary. So um, you're on obviously LinkedIn if people want to kind of check you out on there. So um, I'll kind of link link anything down down below. So there's other videos below as well. So if um, if anyone's got any questions, can they reach out on LinkedIn, Gary? Can they see you on LinkedIn at all? Yeah, for sure. No, I'm more than happy to chat, especially if it's about analysis. I could talk about that all day. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Well, Gary, thanks very much for your time. I will uh, let you get off. So enjoy the rest of your day and I'm sure we'll catch up soon. All right. Thanks, Chris. Cheers. Cheers, Gary.